Okay, so before we get started, I wanted to know how many of you are working on Agile projects, just so I get a sense. Uh, the rest of you, I presume, are working on something else that's not Agile, yeah? How many of you uh, deal with architecture issues, major issues like that? Okay, all right. Okay, so um, I really want to address three questions in this talk. Um, how much architecting do you need and when? Um, how can you manage risks about the architecture in small as well as large projects? Now, some of you are, are already probably doing these things. I hope to uh, entice you to consider some other options for considering architecture. And then I, I want to end with thoughts about what the role of uh, an Agile architect is someone who cares about the architecture, because I think it's really different than traditional software architecture. And I wanna challenge you um, to make sure that you're doing all you can do. Um, so if I think about agile design values, and I, I use a slide in the talk that I gave earlier this morning, we think about design simplicity, we'd like to communicate well. Um, we're part of a team, so, regardless of whether we're doing architecting or designing or things like that, we're part of a team. We have to develop a trust relationship between teammates. Uh, we care about what people who are using our systems want, so we're satisfying their needs, and we're learning as we go. Now, if I think about agile architecture values, what do you value? I think probably highest, very high on my list at least, is something that is designed for test and all the kinds of tests that I do, which is not necessarily a non-value for non-traditional agile, uh, you know, non-traditional or non-agile projects, but it's something that isn't a focus point so much, I find, in other architecture. Um, we, we care about things being modular and rightly, rightly partitioned, uh, we really would like no unintended data redundancy or overlapping functionality. That's why we care about refactoring. Uh, and we're practical, though, in that we do what we need without extras. And that's something that I think is a very strong, agile value. On the other hand, we're challenged um, when we're thinking about the architecture that we really need to support performance and reliability and if we have to have a system that is going to be changing a lot, we want to make sure that it's designed and implemented, not just architected in a way that supports our ability to make those changes. It's got to be usable. You know, it's, there's a lot of things we have to think about. So if you're thinking about how much architecture do you need, um, Alistair Coburn has this chart, and uh, it deals with how much ceremony you need um, and he has four levels of, of a project uh, ceremony, the more, whoops, the more ceremony. Uh, if I have a comfort project and it fails, um, so what? You know, no, no consequences whatsoever. And so he has uh, four types of projects, comfort projects, which, well, it just makes you happy if you made your, your personal game working. Um, if you have a discretionary money kind of project, that's something where if you fail, it costs your company money. And if you're a startup company, it might cost you a lot. Um, essential money means if you fail, your company might go out of business or be severely hurt. And life critical kind of projects are those where if your software or your, so your system fails, people die. Um, so how many of you are working on life critical systems like air, airplane control software? Probably not very many of us are. Uh, we're probably more working in the discretionary money and, and uh, essential money kind of projects in our system. Now the other thing that uh, Alistair talks about is the number of people, whole team involved in a project. Um, and so if you're working on um, something that only involves a few people, um, you need less ceremony. And I'm gonna argue that there probably is a correlation between how much 
architecture you need to consciously do rather than let it emerge, the larger the size goes and the larger up the scale of consequences. But I want to talk first about small products, projects, very briefly, because I would presume that most people doing things are probably working on small projects, or we've all worked on small projects. If I have a definition for a small project, it's a team of six to eight, um, not working on things that if I my software fails, I'm, I'm killing somebody. And typically, the architecture evolves along with the implementation without much risk. Uh, you may or may not need extra attention to architecture. S but we do things that affect the architecture. We have design spikes. You know, the goal of figuring out how do we do something before we commit to it is something we do. Um, now, that's something that takes a few hours to a few days if you follow uh, those practices. And we may use some exploratory code coding or along with some modeling with lightweight way, CRC cards. We might do some scheduling and sketching and noodling. But we're doing these spikes when we raise our hand in a small team and say, I don't know how to do it exactly. And you know what? I think I need to take a step back from just banging it out and to think about it. The other kind of architecture practice that we do is if I do any sort of experimentation, I behave well when I do it. All right, I, I, I make, take a branch. Um, and it's not like uh, I, I like to branch a lot, but if I am doing one of these exploratory sort of spikes, I don't want to mess up other people's forward progress. And if I am really truly doing a design spike, it could be that I merge the code back in and life is happy, and that's when you find something that's very tasty at the end of the branch. Or it might be that I said, mm, you know, I don't know, I might, might even throw it away. Um, now, the other thing that um, if I'm trying to grow my architecture on a small team, I, I don't start out with this big blueprint um, I want to imp implement and learn. And so what I'm going to do is refine what I learn. And so refactoring, finding good abstractions is not something I start spending a lot of time doing. I let it happen. I'm going to use my code to guide this. I'm going to uh, refactor to eliminate redundant code. And then I say, oh, what's the common concept? Um, and whenever you spot duplication, you should be doing this. So I'm growing the structure of my system. Um, and I'm growing my understanding of the domain as I go. So the other thing that I would say that we're doing, or should be doing, is monitoring technical debt. Now, um, Ward Cunningham happens to live in the town that I live in, and, and I've known Ward for many, many years. Um, and one of the things that Ward talks about technical debt that I think is different from the, the way uh, a lot of people think about it is that he says that technical debt is not bad, but it's something that you have to be watching in that if I'm going along implementing and I'm learning things, if I do not then restructure my code to reflect that learning, I'm incurring debt. I mean, that's his definition of debt. That's a little bit different than what I've seen people, people talk about. So, as if I'm just banging out features and trying to implement my code on a small team, it's kind of easy to, you know, oh, well, my tests are passing, hey, maybe my design isn't as clean as I want in the implementation. But, you know, and I would say, you got to stop. You have to, if you have some points for learning, you need to go and, and put it back into your system. Otherwise, it can get out of hand. Now, I'm not saying that I would do this every day, but I know some teams that even take, uh, if they have a week or two kind of uh, development cycle, maybe every third iteration we spend a learning time. You know, gee, we spend half of our iteration cleaning up and relearning. Now, 
that could be controversial, but uh, one way that I find to convince people that what we're doing is that if I uh, am sorting the tasks or the stories that I'm implementing into three different buckets um, as I'm going along, not just burning down my features, but if I'm uh, noting what kind of work I've actually been doing as I'm implementing, this could be a way to justify to other people that I need to do some of this, let's say, uh, update based on learning. So when I think about the kind of programming tasks that I have, there are core, those that are fundamental to your software's success. If you don't get them right, things are going to get screwed up. Then there's the rest, which far requires far less creativity and innovation. Um, and if I think about the rest, it's uh, kind of similar, like if I've implemented something and it's very similar to something I've done before, I'm using the same old framework, it's banging out yet another uh, GUI. Um, we, got the, we know what we're doing, we're talking to the same uh, uh, domain objects, we're, we're accessing the data in a similar way. I'm not really learning a lot, it's just adding. So that's something that's the rest. Or if I'm doing some of these little, uh, I won't say ticky-tacky little tasks, but things that I could always keep myself fretting away doing, that's one of the rest. And then there are some things that lead to new, deeper understanding, and those are revealing problems where uh, I can't plan for those. It's always a surprise. For example, when we discovered in Smalltalk that we were running out of memory space and we needed to implement a 64-bit garbage collector, it's like, oh, how could I have planned for that? I guess I'm being successful here. They require uh, invention and, and innovation, and it's hard to predict when they're going to be done, too. So it's not that you want to seek revealing problems, but you should be tracking what is core and the rest every sprint that you're doing. And if you do that, um, and I sort, uh, not, not that I consciously always want to work on the hard stuff first, but actually that's a good idea. If I sort the tasks that I'm taking off and committing to on a sprint into problem buckets, and if all we're doing is working on the rest, the easy stuff, boy, my velocity is going fast, right? Um, but make sure each iteration gets enough core work accomplished, particularly if it's piling up and you know that you haven't done it, and get the team involved on those core issues. So maybe instead of just me going fast, if it's new stuff, I need to take a little bit of time to think about its architectural uh, innovation and what's required there. Um, one thing that I oftentimes do is that instead of just reflecting is the customer happy at the end of an iteration? In a retrospective, I also might have, uh, you know, post-iteration reflections to say, as a development team, why things were harder than what we thought. Let's say this week, uh, we did not make our, our velocity that we thought we were going to do. And it's not like we're apologetic, but maybe things were tougher. What was that? Maybe there's some architectural implication there. And then if I have, finally, if I have, uh, if I have one of those revealing problems, my advice to you is to take those offline from the normal bang it out kind of feature stuff because you really need to spend some time about it. Now if I think about architectural practice in general, whether it's for small, so those are small team kind of practices, but architectural practices in, in general should be focusing on reducing technical get debt and integrating anything that we learn new into the code. So I'm going to be doing things like refactoring or redesign or rework or code cleanup. Whatever you call it, that's what you need to be doing. Um, and also as a practice, um, besides having tests that support my code, other kinds of tests, wouldn't it be nice if as I go along that there's architectural and design consistency? Because that's going to be able to sustain the way that we're doing things. So as I go along, am I using the APIs in the same way that if I'm using a component that someone else designed? Are we doing error handling the same way across each story? Are we doing logging consistently? 
Are we doing security checks consistently? Those kinds of things help you have architectural integrity in the system. Now, I want to shift for larger projects. Um, and sometimes the bigger the project, the more there is to coordinate. And bigger could be different numbers of people. It could be um, geographic distribution. And anytime you get more than about nine people, how many of you work in, uh, have a project that's larger than nine, nine folks? Okay. All right, any time that you have a team, not everybody has large teams, only a few. For you that are in small teams, go for it. I'm happy for you, but I want to talk about some of these other practices that you might want to consider too. Anytime you have a larger team, it's going to split in some way if it isn't already split. All right, so you can't really have 20 people in one group working together. They will make natural splits if you don't have them divided anyway. But when I have a split, or when I have a larger group like this, nobody knows everything. The fact is, is that there are some experts. You know, we'd like to think that everyone could pick up code and write it, but there are experts, people that are better at doing certain things like optimizing queries or performance tuning. Um, there are specialists. It's not a no-no, I mean, but there are people that are specialized in their skills. Uh, if you ask me to d design the UI, uh, don't, don't ship it. <laughs> but I mean, so for example, and, and, and any sort of work when we get larger groups needs some coordination. Um, and a, a side effect of that, and people have actually studied this, and I've, ex I've experienced it in real life, is if you have groups and you don't worry about architecture, architecture kind of emerges and sort of fits the organizational split. So like when I was at uh, Digitalk doing small talk, this really even happened for us. We had Digitalk North, that was the... Oregon contingent, and we had Digitalk South, which was the California contingent, and we just couldn't work on the same code, right? I mean, we, 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 we ended up in the Portland group doing things like the configuration management and source code tools, and, and they ended up doing some of the other functionality. Uh, so there's just a natural split. Now, I've seen this over and over again, um, and it's, it's okay, but sometimes you may need to really focus on coordinating groups a little more. And what you may want to think about if you have to coordinate is the types of risks that are involved. Um, that's supposed to be a broken egg, not what you had for breakfast, but it like Humpty Dumpty, the egg fell off the wall. Kind of hard to put the egg back together again, so maybe we should scramble it. But there's risks on schedule or budget, um, there's risks on how we're going to execute the plans that we have um, on, on uh, the, the real number of resources it takes to do something, on uh, miscommunications. Uh, gee, that happened a lot between Digitalk North and Digitalk South. And then there are these technical um, risks that happen. Um, Groups in isolation sometimes implement things in a very complicated way, or we don't really understand what should be, you know, what components should be doing what, and so there's ill-defined, uh, kind of misaligned agreements, um, and things are misunderstood. So if I'm thinking about risk management strategies, the easiest way to avoid uh, to manage risk is to avoid it having a small team that's co-located right that knows what they're doing that has the close fit with the customer wow you just go for it um, that's a good way to avoid risk um, we could share risk which means that somebody else does um, part of it um, and we're uh, only responsible for a subset of it um, that's, I think, one of the reasons why people liked outsourcing. We're sharing the risk with those lower cost, yeah, 
how well does that work? We might accept architectural risk and budget for it and say, well, it's okay, it's gonna take us longer, the code's gonna be bulkier, it's gonna be slower, that's just the way we're gonna do it. Um, that doesn't feel very good to me anyway, but I've seen groups do that. And the other way is to reduce risk by mitigating it, which means finding a way to not make it happen, even accepting it, but not uh, you know, making it be something that pops out at you. When we develop in, uh, incrementally, we're reducing risk, right? When we're integrating often, even if we're on a larger team, that's reducing risk. When we're uh, taking time to rather not just slog through the mud and bang something out even though we don't know how to do it, and we take a step back to say, well, we need to go figure this out, I call that a design innovation, before we put it, uh, a plan in place that's gonna affect those three other teams or four other teams, that's a way of mitigating risk. So I'm gonna say that uh, one of the terms that I've heard people say is uh, the most responsible, mo the last responsible moment, don't decide anything about design or architecture until the last responsible moment. And that's sort of scary on larger projects. I'd rather say the most responsible moment. If I think about the last responsible moment, and the reason why I don't like that phrase is because people kind of skate by. They just <gasps> barely do it. The last responsible moment is almost too, too late. And I've seen teams, particularly in larger groups, where the last responsible moment is, maybe for you it was the last responsible moment, but for me, it was way too late in the game. So I'm saying the ro most responsible moment is one that kind of balances and makes the trade-offs between groups that are dependent upon each other. So, uh, one of the misconceptions that I've seen on large teams, and oftentimes I get called in to work with large teams because they have failed. That's actually very sad. I go and see a lot of really badly done systems that, oh, the design was just supposed to evolve, the architecture was supposed to scale, but you know, it just didn't. Um, there's, there's this misconception that if I can just keep my tests working, incrementally do it, that any upfront thinking, planning, and investigating the architecture is a waste. Because we're just gonna change it. Well, I'm saying, well, yeah, you just may wanna change it, but the reality is you need to strike that balance between too much upfront, and if I'm having 100 people work on this engineering product, not having any plan and having them flailing around for a long time. You need to strike that balance. Scrum calls it um, iteration zero or scrum, you know, release zero. And sometimes people think that's the same time as any normal sprint. You know, sprint zero should be two weeks if we have two week sprints. If you're developing a new product for embedded systems, you might want to take more time to do some upfront planning for large, complex projects. And, and in my experience, another thing that I want to do uh, to encourage people to think about is ongoing thinking, prototyping, and architecture experiments, call them experiments, uh, is, is important too, particularly in large projects. So I would like to say that on large complex systems, you want to choose the most responsible moment. You want to balance it, because you don't want to have your ideas about architecture be stale and throw them away. Uh, because, well, I thought about this two years ago, and now we're finally implementing it. That is not what I'm talking about. Now, one way to think about, well, what should I worry about when, is to be aware of uh, your architecture or your system's shearing layers. Uh, Stuart Brand, who wrote the book on how buildings learn, talked about the different rates of change that you need to design buildings for. Um, and if you think about it, a building has a site, it has some physical structure around it, 
It has some skin, which is the facade on it. It has areas designed to allow services like plumbing and electrical to go. And then it has the, the space on the inside and then the stuff here, like the chairs. Now, buildings can change and adapt. I come to Poland and buildings are hundreds of years old and they're still in use. That's awesome. You know, where I come from, the oldest building is maybe 150 years old. It hasn't lived very long. But buildings adapt because the faster layers, um, the services or even the flooring plan, are not obstructed by, by slower ones. In fact, we make it so that, if we're really thinking about it, some buildings are so adaptable that you can like change the walls and, and make the conference spaces bigger or smaller. Those are really adaptable buildings. So if you know what's the rate of change and you make it so that there's not friction between slower and faster layers, that's why buildings can change without a lot of cost. Now, in the software sense, my colleague Joe Yoder and Brian Foote, in their big ball of mud pattern, which isn't just what not to do, talk about the notion of software sharing layers too. And their advice was that factor the system so that things that change at similar rates are together. And so if we're thinking about it, the platform hopefully doesn't change as much as infrastructure. The data schema, some people are even getting to the point of saying I need to have agile uh, database design, right? And I, I believe that. Um, and that these sorts of things that change faster, the fastest thing that you can change is the data. Um, but so the, the thing is to think very carefully about it. And from a design point of view, if you as someone who has um, uh, the responsibility to care about the architecture of your system over time is you need to think about and be aware of your system's shearing layers, understand the rates of what changes, and make sure that they can change without uh, bumping into other parts of the system. So from my point of view, one of the things that that means is that if you find something that's difficult, time-consuming, or tedious, in your daily programming, someone who has architectural responsibilities is going to be trying to fix that in some way. We might create tools or leverage design patterns or build or use frameworks, or, or we might, from the Java perspective, say, you know, struts two is kind of a little old and getting in, long in the tooth. We need to think about another way of doing things. I, I just throw that out as an example. Um, or we might use the data because we can change data to allow things to be configured more easily. But we still don't want to over-design, but we don't want to un under-architect as well. Um, so from my point of view, being agile does not mean that uh, architecture simply em emerges from good development pra practices. And particularly on larger teams, this is the case. This is reality. On small teams where you're all smart and you're keeping each other honest, go for it. Um, but um, it, Agile doesn't guarantee good architectural integrity. In fact, one thing that, um, all right, so the water does get through. <laughs> Trust me. It may be a little slower than you want, and it may have some uh, you know, organic matter that filters through it. Um, but you need to think about, particularly on larger projects or systems that have some kind of performance uh, constraints, that there might be architecture debt, too. It's not just learning. It's like compromises that the system have that you've made that have really significant impacts. And not only are these impacts significant, but over time they get worse, right? So it might be that um, some kinds of architecture debt um, are so costly to reverse that you, you know, might want to throw something away. It gets that bad. Um, but typically, if you're to characterize something, that architecture debt, it's not isolated. Um, it impacts uh, more than just one area of functionality. Um, I, I go and get the privilege of reviewing 
maybe two or three major architectures a year. It's really great. No one ever calls me in when they have cool stuff. It's all really bad. Right? And if you relied upon a poorly designed framework that doesn't handle the needs, that can really drag a team down. Or maybe you said, well, we're going to go into a service-oriented architecture this year, and you just let it go crazy without any sort of consistency about what happens with errors or exceptions or, or uh, extensible service interfaces. Oh, let's just add another one. Anyway, you can end up with a real mess. Okay, so architecture debt is something that I'd like to introduce as a term into your vocabulary. And there's a number of risk reduction tools that you can do, particularly for larger projects that, projects that can help you do this. You may want to understand the product roadmap, like what's going to happen over time rather than just worrying about the next iteration. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the notion of a landing zone where you can specify uh, requirements that stress the architecture, performance, scalability, sorts of things like that. You may want to use design innovation spikes where you actually consciously go off track from delivering features a as a team in order to figure out the architecture before you implement it. And you may want to actually take a, a real spike and really worry about the architecture uh, you may have a backlog of architectural tasks, particularly on larger teams. And I only mention this, one of the ways, you know, in the lean uh, world that they talk about is set-based design, where I, if I really don't know which way to approach it, I, I go through a very tight design cycle let's say I'm picking a security or authorization component, I know companies that just Oh, well, let's, let's go with this one. Well, maybe you really need to evaluate two or three. And if you, the idea with set-based design is to eliminate, as quickly as you can, eliminate a, one of the alternatives. And if you then can do that, great, but you still may have two or three other alternatives. And you have to go through a couple of quick, tight cycles to implement, uh, you know, to figure out and making decisions. So if I talk about product roadmaps as guide, this is my house in Sherwood, Oregon, and, and there's the airport. And you can see there's probably two different ways to get to the airport. One goes around this way, and this is the way I went. Um, this is the way I went when I came this time. Um, where you, roadmaps tell you where you're expected to go and what features are when. And um, it's not like they're always perfect, but if someone has a roadmap for, let's say, every quarter on an ongoing delivery stream, if I know what kind of features are going to be there as an ar someone with architecture uh, concerns, then that's going to influence the work and efforts and things that I'm going to suggest to other folks. So if you have no road roadmap and your scrum, uh, you know, your product owner is just slinging things at you randomly. Um, well, it's very hard to know whether I should go that way or this way with my architecture. Now, a landing zone is, um, is a way to capture, and I learned about this from my friends at Intel, who use this technique a lot on product development as well as software development projects. And a landing zone is something that um, has a range of acceptable values for a requirement rather than just one value. So you know, if we're used to customer acceptance tests, we say they pass. Yeah, here's the value that you must have. But sometimes architecturally, it's very hard to say, how many transactions per second should we do under this kind of load case? So we might want to have a minimum value, a target value, and something that we would think we could get if we invested certain kinds of architectural activities. And you may have a set of these criteria that you come up with. Hopefully, the architect or someone who's doing uh, leadership in the technical area is involved in these. And the minimum, actually, it's funny, but the minimum can seem really unreasonable in isolation. But if you have like 20 uh, attributes that you're trying to kind of get on there, 
well, if you miss, uh, get the minimum for one, maybe the others two can slide. I don't like to be perfect, but if I'm building a complex system, I'd like to know the ranges of possible values. And I want to keep monitoring them as we're going. Now, we may want to recalibrate our landing zone. But so, for example, this is an example from an old um, smartphone. This is, I should probably update this. And you'll notice that um, the minimum, for example, on screen size is the same as the um, target. So that's the case when, well, I could do better, but it's OK if my minimum and target are the same. Um, and actually, the weight of phones has gone way down, but you see that they're close. Uh, it's OK that the minimum and the target could be the same. I've done these landing zones when I spent three years working at Freddie Mac, which does the secondary mortgage market um, loan guarantees. So I'm responsible for the loan crisis in the United States. Okay. And actually getting, um, agreeing on landing zone targets, particularly when they're architecturally relevant, was kind of tough when we first got started. Someone has to make a first rough cut. Right? They have to stick their neck out, and then someone else is going to counteract it. And you, but, but you base your targets based on evidence and history. So if you're replacing one system with another, you should know what you're doing. And then you know, discuss and find to tune as a, as a group. Us involved with architecture had our equal say in this as well. We just didn't say, oh, marketing says it must go faster than the speed of light, so that's OK. So the granularity, and this is uh, actually from that system, and I can't tell you what that system is. Sometimes they're talking about data quality, and that was over a number of use cases where you were entering data in, and we were doing validation. Um, we wanted to have a, uh, that. We had a lot of different performance on certain kinds of transactions. I won't tell you what these are, because it's top secret. Um, and the usability was, was something, so they're pretty, pretty high level in that case. But that was boiled down into a lot of architectural tests that we had to make sure that we're measuring it. And so I can, if I have a landing zone that gives me a range of values on a big complex system, um, it allows me to identify risks, it allows me to plan for some kinds of innovations that I might need, and it also says, well, maybe we don't know how to do uh, big data. You know, gee, Hadoop is cool, but boy, have we, we better figure out what we're going to do in our protocol buffers and how we're going to communicate, gee, before we just start writing code that does that. Um, and from a, someone who is involved with making sure that the architecture lives and grows, um, it helps make sense of the bigger picture. Sometimes teams that are delivering features are only focusing on does that story pass? But what happens when one of these values goes below the minimum? You know, usually you're making trade-offs. So sometimes I may have added another feature, and then all of a sudden the transaction throughput goes down. Have you ever had that happen? Um, and and if we're if we're even implementing the very first story, oftentimes stories start with a happy pass, right? When you implement the functionality. And then when all those edge cases are there, things slow down. Gosh, you ever had that happen? So what happens when we're incrementally uh, implementing stuff? How does it affect our, our things? So, so I, I, I introduced the idea of landing zones as something to consider when you're wanting to make um, systems that are complex and multidimensional. Um, balance it and think about it architecturally. Now, I wouldn't have hundreds of landing zone targets. That's really hard. But a dashboard of, uh, in, in the Freddie Mac, for example, we had one for each major sub subsystem, a set of, because there were performance was usually a lot of that as well as data quality. Now, another task, uh, thing that you might want to do is to have a design innovation spike. And I've done this on, on larger projects, too. Instead of um, XP spikes where the team themselves go off and say, eh, you know, uh, we didn't really figure it out, so I, we need to take, take time and do a little uh, design. Uh, a design innovation spike is something, if, particularly if I have a road map, and I know that three months down the line I'm supposed to be implementing 
auditability for tax calculations when I do splits on loans, and I don't have a clue how to do that because we have not audited anything, right? Maybe I need a short innovation spike uh, before we're, we're committing to doing it in production. Um, so I may do doing prototyping, um, uh, looking outside. That's a way of, of saying, I want to see what my competitor might be doing or someone else who might have done it so that I can uh, you know, borrow that good design idea. I may be uh, doing some uh, prototyping in order to assess things. Um, I may be uh, vetting an idea and, and uh, eliminating options. So for example, um, I've, I've done, these are uh, personally uh, things that I've done um, in uh, innovation spikes. And they were run just like little XP projects where we were actually building code and doing this, but we weren't committing to production yet. They were time boxed. None of them took more than six weeks because they didn't want us to do this, but they were things that we were trying to do to make things go forward. Um, now, it turns out we could uh, parse documents and uh, figure out the business rules that we needed to implement, but since so many of them were unenforceable based on the loan documents we got in, we said, well, that's kind of cool that we could do this, but it's not going to solve our problem. Um, so sometimes um, when I do these kind of innovation spikes, I may come up and say, uh, you know, we don't really know how to do this. And that will cause, um, you know, failure is an option. It per permits options that shift your goals. Um, so I wanted to skip on to um, three different ways that I found useful on larger projects to manage architectural risks. On small projects, you're doing your team practices. You're worrying about your technical debt. But sometimes on larger projects, you need to be aware of uh, the impacts on other people and other groups. So if you have a product backlog, I've seen teams do the following. Anything that's architecturally relevant that's on the backlog, and they, they, they allow people to put technical tasks on their architect architecture tasks, and those things are there and sort of, they're sort of tagged so that we give them extra special attention. It could be that if you have uh, teams that are specialists and they can't be involved all the time, you may also have uh, an architecture backlog that is dependent to other feature backlogs done by teams. Um, something that I have recently done is if there's a small core of people working on the architecture, instead of using these things, they have um, a, a Kanban and they have a limit to the kind of work that they're doing that we're doing, and uh, if anything gets really um, high priority, it goes in. If something is impeded, we may put something that we have to go do an architecture support for a task, and it goes to the front of our queue, and then we work it through until it's done. Um, so those are three different ways of managing architecture risk. If I'm using, um, just wanted to say, if I'm using um, a architecture Kanban, then the work that anybody doing architecture is very explicit and, and you can see the progress. I actually like Kanbans that way rather than burying it, particularly when I'm coordinating the work of other groups. So it's not just that they're noodling around, but I can see the work flowing through there. So things that might go on a, a, a architecture backlog or in the Kanban might be uh, some kind of prototype, some framework development if I need to figure out the roadmap. And uh, this kind of work can be bounded and, 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 and uh, managed. It doesn't have to be uh, this silent architecture group off in the back. So I just wanted to end with two thoughts. What do agile architects do? Um, and why do they do it? If I think about it, and this is sort of like a, a game. You should think about this as like, uh, when I think about, uh, structure of system, uh, the data, the concurrency, the components, development, the implementation concerns. Uh, that's typically where, as developers, we're most comfortable. And we spend a lot of time there. But um, I'm going to say that architects I know, particularly on larger projects, oftentimes go and have to um, 
explore and talk to people in production, deal with uh, balancing and aligning stakeholder goals. They're making trade-offs on cost of things rather than just implementing it. So they kind of wander around. And it's not like they're not doing anything. In fact, um, they may be exploring potential paths, but they're doing it in short experiments. Um, they're going to do uh, some architectural work, but it's always grounded in reality. I think that's very different than on non-agile projects. Sometimes they're just pie in the sky, or we call them ivory tower architects, but architecture is very uh, different on agile projects. Um, if I'm contrasting agile and traditional architecture, in traditional, their big picture thinking may be drawing a lot of those diagrams that no one ever looks at, right? Or, then they're not so hands-on. I've ha actually had an architect at a company says, oh, I don't read code, right? It's like, hmm, okay. <laughs> And maybe they're more focused on compliant. Are you conforming to the corporate way of doing things? But on agile architects, they balance the big picture and details. They produce what's m needed to make an uh, informed decision, and they're hands-on. In fact, if, if I see uh, architects that haven't done some coding in the past you know, recent time, there's a problem there. Um, and they're focused on sustaining and growing the system. And they may produce models, one of the things is, but I think that there's a difference between the big M architecture models and agile arch ar architecture models. Um, CRC cards is one way. Um, it's intended to communicate. Oftentimes it's discarded as soon as you've um, communicated. It could be formal or informal, and it's made, um, we create things as, as it's needed. We don't just say oh, we're producing models because it's fun. Here's an example, CRC cards, you've seen that? That's MVC, that's an architectural pattern. Uh, here's an example from a, a, what we did for the uh, Freddie Mac. Uh, each component had this, in this layered complex system with 250 developers, we had a very brief description. Um, here's an example I can talk about high level of database responsibilities. But at the end of the day, agile architecture has a different set of values. We're balancing good design with compromises of getting things done. We're not, we're not just doing architecture and being purists. We have to get delivery. And we're focusing on testable qualities of the system. We want to be hands-on. In fact, coding, building, reviewing. Now, if an architect is always on the, someone with an architecture role is always on the critical path, that's a problem. But we want to care and look and be part of the team, which means that we're not necessarily dictating anything to anybody so much as convincing our colleagues about good approaches and reasons. I think about my friend Francesco Cirillo. He came to my house and spent a couple of days talking about design. And he's the ultimate epitome of someone who's he's hands on. He was cooking for me. He's, he's, he's besides being the inventor of Pomodoro, um, he also is a, a professionally trained cook. And so he has this whole view about design stewardship and architecture stewardship, which means I follow through. I have ongoing attention. If I don't, it's going to burn, right? So I don't just uh, do a little architecture and wander away. I don't want to uh, ignore the little things that can undermine the ability of a system to grow and change and adapt. Now, there's some indicators that you've paid enough attention to architecture, whether you're on a small team as a, someone who's having a leadership role in architecture or if you're on a larger team. And sustainability is what it's all about. Um, developers, if they're adding stuff that isn't breaking the mold, they're able to do it without a breaking much of a sweat. New, new functionality doesn't break it uh, often. Interfaces get stable over time. Things are consistent. Gee, we do things similar ways. Um, this is a good one. There aren't uh, areas where somebody says, no, I don't want to work on that, because <laughs> you've paid attention. Defects typically are localized, and we can integrate new functionality 
incrementally without totally throwing things away. So I hope I've given you uh, compelling reasons, whether you're on small teams or large, to think about architecting. And it's a role, not a job title. And sometimes what that means is that you have to convince and persuade, as well as just, gee, in the old way, non-agile world, you could just say, do it my way, right? Now, whether people would listen or not is another story. But um, So thank you very much. <laughs>